Hi friends, this is your buddy Carl for another daily Bible reading and da 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 da, it is September 1st, September 1 of 2020. How about that? Well, let's dive right in. We are finishing up the book of Job. Interesting way to start kind of the fall, September, October, November. We think of it like that, yeah? September 1st. Okay, so the Lord has been responding to all of this stuff that Job and his friends have been speaking, and really he's addressing Job. So here you go. God just basically saying, yeah, were you there? Or have you done this? Remember that phrase, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? God pretty much speaks that to mankind in any form. Like when people think, ah, you know, like we think we know God you know, the intellectuals, and even believers, you know, we, we think we can get fully comprehend all the timeline. Now, God does reveal himself to us as needed to know. <laughs> but the point here in Job is like, we can't fully know all eternal things. That's God's job. All right, so let's pick it up here on September 1st at Job chapter 40, and we're going to finish the book of Job today. How about that on September 1st? Here we go, 40. Then the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? Hmm. Job responds to the Lord, verse 3. Then Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. <laughs> so the Lord challenges Job again. Here we go. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you. You must answer them. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? All right, put on your glory and splendor your honor and majesty. Give vent to your anger. Let it overflow against the proud. Humiliate the proud with a glance. Walk on the wicked where they stand. Bury them in the dust. Imprison them in the world of the dead. Then even I would praise you, for your own strength would save you. Gosh, God is in this tone of correction and kind of mocking Job as we can Get our own flesh engaged in that too. How about that? Wow. Your own strength would save you. Verse 15, take a look at the behemoth, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. It's, see its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit to, tightly together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. Sorry about that. Its limbs are bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. The mountains offer it their best food where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants, hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the willows beside the stream. It is not disturbed by the raging water rivers, not concerned with the swelling Jordan rushes as the swelling Jordan rushes around it. No one can catch it off guard or put a ring in its nose and lead it away. Chapter 41. The Lord's challenges, his challenge continues. Yeah. Can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? So these must have been massive sea creatures, right? Like ancient whales or something. So... Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity? Will it agree to work for you to be your slave for life? Wow. Can you make it a pet like a bird or give it to your little girls to play with? Will merchants try to buy it to sell it in their shops? Will its hide be hurt by spears or its head by a harpoon? If you lay a hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows. You won't try that again. No, it is useless to try to capture it. The hunter who attempts it will be knocked down, and since no one dares to disturb it, who then can stand up to me? Oh, Lord, wow. How about that? 
God, boom, who has given me anything I need to pay back? Everything under heaven is mine. Yes, Lord, it is. So we can be in awe of the Lord. This is the Lord himself unpacking this information to Job. I want to emphasize Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Who can strip off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who can pry open its jaws for its teeth are terrible? Its scales are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. They are so close together that no air can get between them. Each scale sticks tight to the next. They interlock and cannot be penetrated. So this creature that God made, man, I, I've got to look for some sketches of Leviathan and see what ancient beast this must have been. An ancient sea creature, some kind of amazing, what, whale, lizard, dragon, I, I don't know. But God's making the point with Job, really? Yeah, and I'm greater than that. Uh, of course he is. Verse 18, when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. It must have been some kind of dragon, right? Smoke streams from its nostrils like st steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. The tremendous strength in the Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Its heart is hard as rock, hard as a millstone. When it rises, the mighty are afraid, gripped by terror. No sword can stop it, no spear, dart, or javelin. Iron is nothing but straw to that creature, and bronze is like rotten wood. Arrows cannot make it flee. Stones shot from a sling are like, a, like bits of grass. Clubs are like a blade of grass, and it laughs at the swish of javelins. Its belly is covered with scales as sharp as glass. It plows up the ground as it drags through the mud. Leviathan makes the water boil with its commotion. It stirs the depths like a pot of ointment. The water glistens in its wake, making the sea look white. Nothing on earth is its equal. No other creature so fearless. Of all the creatures, it is the proudest. It is the king of beasts. So God made this king of beasts. The lion is not the king of beasts. It was Leviathan, okay? All right, so here we go for September 1st, chapter 42. Job is now going to be restored. Watch what happens. Uh, commentary here. In response to God's speech, Job is, he humbles himself. God rebukes his three friends for adding to Job's suffering by their false assumption and critical attitudes. Job's material possessions and family are restored and he receives even greater blessings than he had before. Those who persist in trusting God will be rewarded. That's supposed to be the theme of that. Those that hold to the very end, that's the key, right? Wow. Chapter 42, the last chapter of Job, his restoration. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you, Lord. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Pause, people. Question, what? Job has seen God? He's not only hearing the speech, but somehow God has presented himself to Job. Ah, uh, stunning. Verse 6, Job says, I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Yeah, you better. <laughs> And he gets it. All right. Uh, verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer on your behalf I will not treat you as you deserve, for you have not spoken accurately about me, as my servant Job has. Pause. Remember all these speeches his friends gave, and it sounds to our religious minds like, well, Lord, that kind of sounds right to me. Or at least I've thought that. 
And yet God goes, these guys, they haven't perceived at all the truth of what has happened, even Job. See, and we know that being told the story after the fact, right? We knew that God had bragged about Job and Satan was kind of like, oh yeah, let me get at him a while and see what happens. That's, that's the Carl version, right? But now he's kind of reprimanding because all these speeches didn't speak anything clearly about who God really is, and that's what he's saying. You did not speak about me accurately, as Job has. Verse 9, so Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer for them. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and sisters and former friends came and feasted with him in his home, and they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. He named his first daughter Jem uh, Jemima. Jemima. Yeah, there it is. The second Keziah and the third Kiran Hapuk. In all the land, no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had lived a long and full life. There you go, folks, the book of Job. Ah, I know there's lots of commentaries and theological discussions of that, but suffice it to say, Job basically survived his tempting or his ordeals, even with all the moaning and groaning, right? And God, in the end, blesses him again. All right, folks, September 1st. Today's psalm is Psalm 45. For the choir director, a love song to be sung to the tune of lilies, a psalm of the descendants of Korah. The poem here, the theme, is the poem to the king, possibly King Solomon, on the occasion of his wedding. While this psalm was written for a historic occasion, it is also seen as a prophecy about Christ and his bride, the church, right? Who will praise him throughout all generations. So here we go. Listen to this beautiful Psalm 45. To the tune of the lilies, beautiful words stir my heart. I will recite a lovely poem about the king, for my tongue is like the pen of a skillful poet. Now I will pause here. Leanne and I wrote a song years ago that goes, um, uh, My heart is stirred by a noble theme As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. And I sing my praise for there is no other. Great and mighty are you, O Lord. If you've ever, never heard that, you know, you could uh, check it out on Leanne Albrecht's Spotify. <laughs> it's called Great and Mighty. Great and mighty are you, O Lord, based on Psalm 45. So there you go. If you've got Leanne's CD, I can't even remember the CD that it's on <laughs> about that. But the song is called Great and Mighty, not like the song Mighty and Glorious that we wrote a couple years ago that's on last year's CD. But there you go. Psalm 45. Beautiful words stir my heart. I will recite a lovely poem about the king, for my tongue is like the pen of a skillful poet. You are the most handsome of all. Gracious words stream from your lips. God himself has blessed you forever. Put on your sword, O mighty warrior. You are so glorious, so majestic, in your, maj in your majesty right out to victory, defending truth humility, and justice. Go forth to perform awe-inspiring deeds. Your arrows are sharp, piercing your enemies' hearts. The nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. 
myrrh, aloes, and cassia perfume your robes. In ivory palaces, the music of strings entertains you. King's daughters are among your noble women. At your right hand stands the queen, wearing jewelry of finest gold from Ophir. Listen to me, O royal daughter. Take to heart what I say. Forget your people and your family far away. For your royal husband delights in your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The princess of Tyre will shower you with gifts. The wealthy will beg your favor. The bride, a princess, looks glorious in her golden gown. In her beautiful robes, she is led to the king, accompanied by her bridesmaids. What a joyful and enthusiastic procession as they enter the king's palace. Your sons will become kings like their father. You will make them rulers over many lands. I will bring honor to your name in every generation. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Ah, that's beautiful poetry, folks. Psalm 45. Yes, a poem for the king. Awesome. All right, September 1st. Today's proverb is Proverbs 22, verse 14. The mouth of an immoral woman is a dangerous trap. Those who make the Lord angry will fall into it. I'm not going to unpack that. That's just how it is. We have to watch anyone, anything that seduces us. That's the idea of this. It's, it, excuse me, I have a fly flying around the camera up there. All right, there he is. I don't know what he's doing. Looking for lunch. He likes the light. <laughs> he's buzzing me too. All right, Proverbs. The mouth of an immoral woman or a rotten fly climbing around. Yeah, distractions. It's a dangerous trap. So anything that's a lust or draws us away from the Lord it makes the it makes the Lord's anger will fall right. Those who make the Lord angry will fall into this trap, right? And that's a bigger proverb than I want to. I've unpacked enough. There you go. Guard your heart. Thank you, Lord. All right. So today, September first, Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eleven, and then we'll finish out chapter five. Because we understand our fearful responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. Are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you a reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. Ooh, Lord, help us to guard our hearts. Don't brag about our work. Or if you have a ministry, everybody has a ministry, not just professional ministries. It's not about that. Yeah, we minister to the Lord in obedience in all we do. Yeah, but rather have a sincere heart. Don't boast on anything. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Either way, Christ's love, his love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our own life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Pause. Always pointing out carefully in the word, since we believe that Christ died for all, he did die for all. So we have excess if we receive it, right? That's where we have to remember. Scripture is clear on this. We also believe that we all have died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. If we receive this new life, uh, another statement of receiving or of believing or of believing on Christ, Jesus' sacrifice is not just a universal blanket of salvation. Yes, it's for those that believe or receive. Verse 16, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Folks, there it is again. Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. I'll let the word teach for itself. There you go. Verse 18, and all of this is a gift from God, 
who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ. Ooh, Jesus, God, Emmanuel, God with us. God was in, that's a whole other debate too. Right, so God offers himself on the cross. Jesus as God, right? I know this is mind boggling, but anyway, the point being, God was, it was God himself reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. There you go. God doesn't count in Christ. Our sins don't, they're not counted against us, folks. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God, please. That's our, that's our mission, folks. The discipling thing, the evangelistic call of the churches. Please come back to God. God loves you. Believe in Jesus. Receive what Jesus did. This is the amazing power of God making his way, making him available to all people who will come. That's the call. Verse 21, for God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Oh, yes, Lord. Folks, Wow. All right. I'm going to just read the first verse of chapter six. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you on the day of salvation. I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Folks, that's the call. In other words, if you've heard this, if you if I beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. So what he's saying is don't just kind of like blow off like, oh, this is exciting news, but but reject Christ. Oh, who would do that? But some people are like, oh, this sounds marvelous, but I don't know, man. The Jesus thing, really? Is it just Jesus? I go, yeah, but it's simple. You don't work for it. It's not like any other religion. There is no other God. There is no other God. There's no other way. Jesus himself says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and those that come to me will be saved, right? Uh, all right, so that's, <laughs> that's September 1st, folks. Man, September 1st, powerful reading throughout all of Scripture. Job's life is resolved. We finished Job. Great teaching, great encouragement in Psalm 45, and then the Proverbs giving us this uh, yeah, it's always wisdom unpacking in the Word of God. And then the New Testament, man, Paul, through his letters, lays out the gospel again and again and again and again, confirming what Jesus Christ and the apostles brought. Yeah? Okay. All right. I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. Bless you in your daily reading. We'll see you again for another reading tomorrow. Bye-bye.